guys welcome welcome back to side hustle pro today is another episode where we are interviewing a side hustle pro alum one of the goats of side hustle pro who has taught me so much taught many of you so much and we're gonna get you know a little bit of an update on what she has going on so today in the guest chair is jerry evans the owner of turning natural now jerry you know i have to read your bio for those who haven't listened to her very first episode it was episode 67 and it aired in October 2017 like crazy I can't believe it's been that long but so we definitely have a lot to catch up on so for those who don't know Jerry is the owner of turning natural juice bars and she has revolutionized juicing in the hood (laughs) um, by bringing better choices to communities that otherwise lack access to healthy options Um, it's funny because the first time I even really discovered turning natural it was by chance and you know I was in the 8th street location in Washington DC and I was like I really need to know more about the woman behind this because it was just (laughs) such an awesome experience and Jerry has dedicated her mission to serving the often underserved and overlooked she grew up in southeast Washington DC herself and she was adamant and relentless in reminding us that not only do we need but we deserve good things in our communities and with over 15 years of experience in the health and wellness industry, focusing on nutrition education, holistic alternative health, and food nutrition, Jerry has integrated her knowledge with action. It was Jerry's late mother, Annette Turner, who founded Turning Natural after being diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. Um, Sadly, after almost 10 years living in remission, the disease returned and Annette fought her final fight in 2010. Shortly after her mother's transition, Jerry quit her then excelling career as an aeronautical engineer to pursue helping those who were looking to take care of themselves. And she has been recognized since for her work in many publications and on platforms. And she is just so dynamic. So without further ado, I'm not even going to keep on reading this because I feel like we can cover even more just talking. So welcome back to the guest chair, Jerry. Thank you, Nikayla. Hey. Hey. Thank you for being here. Um, so like I said, we have not spoken since um, October 2017. Let me know, um, since the last time we spoke, what has happened? <laughs> at wow. that time, how many locations did you have at that time, right? I believe, so 2017, I had three locations uh-huh. at the time. And yeah. now 2021, we're at, we're going to open our sixth location. Woo! Um, really, really really <laughs> thank you thank you yeah so what four years three stores later um we're on store six and it and where are all the locations like are they all dc proper these days or like where where are the different locations oh so, yes there's five in dc um there's one in maryland and we are looking to expand um out of the dc Maryland, Virginia area. Okay. Very, I want to say soon, but the way my life is set up right now, not <laughs> at the all. way this past year has been set up, right? Listen, yeah. Um, but yeah, so six locations. Wow, that's crazy. I, you know, it's looking back on it, you're like, wow, 2017, what was happening? Right. And to move to three stores later, three more stores later, right. it's like, we've been busy. Very busy. And I'm curious what goes into your process when you think about expansion, because to me, it's like it's hard enough opening one location. It's hard enough getting that in a in a place where it's it's centered with staffing and, you know, you you know, your foot traffic, you know what things are like, you know what to expect, you know how to plan out projections, then to also be building out another location, dealing with any kind of surprises that might happen with construction or anything like that. So when you are getting ready to expand, what does that process look like? What are your considerations? So in the beginning, like the first three stores, it was kind of like whatever, I don't want to say whatever fell in my lap, but it was like whatever fell in my lap. Like you would have someone come and say, hey, Here's a location. I think this will be great. Yeah. And then 8th Street, which was that third location, it was a dilapidated building. 
And my experience prior to that was kind of smooth selling, mm-hmm. right? Other than the, the financial hiccups of building out a location. So I'm like, oh, it's going to be really easy. Walk into <laughs> HP. There's a hole in the ceiling. Oh. The floor is uneven. And I was like, oh, wow, this is a full construction space. Right. So, you know, no more YouTube University at this point. Uh, DCRA, which is DC Consumer Regulatory Affairs, they're like, no, girl, you need a full contractor. Um, <laughs> so, when, that- when we talked to you in 2017, you were like, YouTubing how to fix pipes, how to. <laughs> I had YouTube and a Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now it's like, okay, now it's it's real deal. So yeah. finding contractors. And, you know, at this point, third location, you can kind of sort of afford, you know, a really good plumber and a really good right. electrician. And honestly, the plumber, the electrician that I found around store two, they've been with me through all six stores. Okay. Um, and so, and they're black. Yes. Um, so I, I make it, I'm extremely intentional about that. It's not to say it hasn't been a struggle, but it's been super intentional about that. And so after the third location, that's when we kind of got on people's radar. Um, so like bigger construction companies, um, bigger landlords, so like JBG and East Bank and Douglas Development, now they're coming to you and they're saying, hey, I have this perfect location because everybody loves a good story. You know, the right. girl from the hood who mom passed away from cancer, used to be an engineer, you know, put her here. Like, here's the, here's the location. And... Um, after 8th Street, I was like, no more big stores, meaning no more 2,000 square foot, because we didn't need it. You know, okay. the, the model changed. And so I just needed roughly about 700 square feet, no more than that. And that's been the model going forward. So it made so it are, easier. So is it more of like a, a carry out kind of vibe or can people still sit and, you know, have their juice if they choose? So now the way that COVID is set up. Right. right. We want you to grab and go. <laughs> um, we, I wanted to create this environment where people could sit and read and chill. But right now, it's just proving to not be the best model. And then, mm-hmm. honestly, it it reduced. I'm a numbers girl, so mm-hmm. the maximum amount of profit that I could get out of the maximum amount of time that I can get without, you know, without having so many staff members, because that was a big, big issue is maintaining six to seven people at each location because you're trying to cover at least 2000 square feet. Then you had to create mm-hmm. products that pay for that DC rent ain't cheap. Mm-hmm. So it was like, okay, how do I figure this out? So 700 square feet, there's still plenty of options that you can choose from very much grab and go so yeah very much grab and go at this point speaking of maximizing profit and also figuring out how to do that with staffing one of the things we touched on and i'd love to know you know what's been the update what have you learned since then is just how tough hiring can be how tough motivating and you know maintaining um employees long term can be so <laughs> in the last few years, I mean, is there anything you can share that you've learned in how to keep that team building going? Yeah, well, we've had plenty of lessons. Uh, one thing <laughs> one thing that you will learn in this industry where you have to employ people yeah. is the difference between being like an entrepreneur and being a manager. Mm. I'm great at being an entrepreneur. Yeah. I suck and managing people um, because <laughs> it's just you're managing personalities you're managing whatever issues they have going on yeah. when my mindset is i know where i'm trying to go and all of this is kind of like in my way if mm-hmm. that makes sense no, that and makes so sense. what i decided the beginning of the pandemic what was the beginning of the year and then the pandemic happened yeah. I was ready to get rid of everybody. That <laughs> this was like December, November yeah. of 2019. I said, I'm just going to clear the slate, just start all over. Mm-hmm. And I had to be honest with myself. Uh, one of my grandmother's favorite sayings is the fish rots from the head. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the mistakes that they were making is because I didn't give them the proper tools 
to manage, to lead, to Mm -hmm. execute what I needed them to execute. Mm -hmm. And so I spent majority of the pandemic training. We promoted every shift leader to store manager, which gave them way more experience and responsibilities. Um, So in turn, took a lot of things off of my plate. And then I decided to outsource for things like HR uh, because it just employing people that you have, like they can reach out and touch you is a different environment. So I sat with my core team and I asked them what their previous job was before coming here and becoming a store manager. And we don't hire managers. You have to grow up the ranks. Mm -hmm. So um, some one had Ticketmaster, another one was Chipotle. Um, Another one worked in a dental office. And so I asked him, I said, what what was the CEO's name? Couldn't tell me. What do they drive? Couldn't tell me. And so it's like the direct access that you have produces this level of familiarity that could be good, but also toxic. Mm. And so I decided to create some sort of distance where I only talk to a few people. I really don't want to walk in the store and know who staff is. So... (laughs) And that's just where I needed to be. So producing people who I knew were capable and giving them the tools to make them capable, going through books and training, things like that has proven to take a lot of that pressure off of off of me that I didn't have before. And I want to just dig a little bit deeper into that point about familiarity, because I think that some people might think that comes off cold or whatever, whatever. But I know what you're trying to say in that. When you are trying to run a business and people think they know you on a familiar level, you know, like they can crack jokes, they can talk about, oh, let me catch you up on what so-and-so has going on. It might seem all good at first, but then Mm -hmm. when it's time to handle business, it really blurs the lines. Either, you know, they don't take things as seriously or they are more offended that you would try to discipline or talk, you know, like address business with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the point of view I think you might be. That's the experience I think you might be touching on there. Yeah. And because at that point, accountability comes off as uh, criticism. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, I'm like, no criticism, which is personal. personal (laughs) And I'm like, you know, I I also have a job to do. And my team will tell you when their birthdays come around, you know, we make sure that we send a cake to the store. We make sure there's a card that the entire team has, you know, signed and created. So there's I still want to be connected to my team, but in a way that makes sense. Yeah. And that's sustainable because it's not sustainable for me to, for every staff member to have my telephone number. Yeah. yeah. I can never get anything done. No. And when you say outsourcing HR, is that like a platform that you use or is it something where you had to kind of research and find like somewhere local? I definitely had to outsource um, and research because it was very specific. Like, I want it out. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I'll see your stories. I'm like, okay, okay. She's she's at that point where she's too tied to the business. Like, you want to wake up some mornings and not worry, right, about what's going on. Does so-and-so show up on time? Like, is that store going to be open today? <laughs> 7 o'clock. I don't want to yeah. wake up at 4 o'clock. Um, yeah. So there were a lot of companies who just wanted to take over HR, but I wanted a management group. Mm-hmm. I wanted someone that was going to come in and continuously train, continuously hold people accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, so HR was just a small part of it that okay. ended up blossoming into a management group uh, because, yeah, it it is a lot. It's so many different moving parts. You have vendors, you have staff, you have landlords, you have developing relationships. It was too much. Um, mm-hmm. And so in order for me to stay sane and friendly. <laughs> Like, oh, it had to happen. Cut this out. It had to happen. Okay, I I respect that. I respect that, and I it's it's so great hearing you know that growth and how you've done it, what has worked for you. Speaking of growth, I've seen that you've invested a lot of time into personal development over the last few years. I've seen you go away to Dartmouth's um, MBA program for entrepreneurship. I think it was a, a. two week or, or something four week four month you you let me know <laughs> i'm just making stuff up now but I, I admire it tell me more about it <laughs> so 
they eventually reached out and they have this accelerated program where you go in and you are talking to some of the best of the best when it comes to business management and just how to grow your business. And one thing that I, I took away from that that was so important is that I didn't empower my team enough because I have I have issues with control. I want to do it my way. I know I'm going to do it the best. I'm going to do it the fastest. But I was running people and not a process or, or a system. And so it helped me create a system that was sustainable um, and, and really dive deep into numbers, which I love. Like, I love to see that we're profitable. I love to see, you know, us making money. Yeah. And I really appreciate it because it was specific to a diverse group of people, minorities. Um, so you had black, you had brown, um, you had the LGBTQ community there. Like, it, I mean, it just, it was so many different dynamics of business and not everyone was a CEO. Either they were, you know, they may have been C-suite of a company, but it just gave you that that accelerated time and intimate time with a lot of professors who were able to kind of catapult you to the place that you needed to be or want to be. What's an example of empowering your team? Something that you weren't doing before that you now do it and that we can think about doing as well. Because I think that is so important to let go of the control and figure out how to really empower others Um, I would say giving them autonomy to make choices and not being fearful of, because even though I'm, I'm gentle, it's still on my face, (laughs) very much on my face. And so they, they explained to me that they were afraid to make decisions out of fear of disappointing me or making me upset. And I'm saying, well, this is the only way that you can learn is if you make this mistake, because what makes me upset is when you don't make a decision. Mm. And you come to me for very minor things that you could have figured out. And then if it was wrong, we could have fixed it. But to do nothing in action is like, that's the best way to make me upset. (laughs) Yeah, giving them room to to make choices without having to run things past me. And surprisingly, it wasn't that many mistakes. They really didn't make that many mistakes because they have been practicing these decisions anyway. All right, guys, I know you're spending a lot of time thinking about your side hustle, how to get started, all of that, right? But have you thought about how you're going to email and stay connected with your audience? What about how you're even going to make money? Well, don't worry, because AWeber has thought about all of this for you. AWeber has all the tools that you need to stay connected with your audience, share your messages about your products or services, and make money. With AWeber, you get the email marketing solutions that you need to grow your business. You can choose from a huge library of pre-built email templates, so you don't have to have a lot of experience or be a graphic designer to create beautiful emails. You can just use the easy drag and drop features to create your custom emails. You can even connect your brand's Facebook page and then an email design will automatically populate. How cool is that? AWeber also has a landing page builder with access to unlimited landing page templates and a pre-stocked image library. So you can create your custom landing page in minutes without paying thousands of dollars to a graphic designer. Plus, using the landing page builder, you have the ability to collect payments. So you can set up a landing page and start selling your products or services online directly through AWeber. How cool is that? It only takes a few minutes to get set up and boom, start making money. Oh, and you definitely need to use AWeber's web push notifications. It allows you to send messages to your visitors even when they're not currently on your website. Yes, (laughs) that's pretty cool. And all of these features are included in an account. No a la carte pricing. They even have a free plan. But guess what? Side Hustle Pro listeners, you can try AWeber's Pro Plan right now. No risk, no credit card. Just visit aweber.com and use code HUSTLEPRO to get a free 30-day trial of AWeber's Pro Plan. Again, that's aweber.com and use code HUSTLEPRO to try the Pro Plan free for 30 days. Enjoy! Enjoy! 
You know, I relate to that so much. I think that I too struggle from that feeling of like, I can do it the best or like, or you know what, this is going to take me too long to explain. So I'll just do it. And what you're describing also requires a shift in our mind as well to be open to mistakes. Yeah. And, and that's probably why to you, it, it, it wasn't even so many mistakes, you know, because the old you who was more controlling might have thought like, oh, I can't believe they did this. But yeah. Once you were able to see, like, I need this to happen so that we can grow and so that they can, you know, do an even better job of making the decision for me, then you're able to be like, oh, that that wasn't even that big of a deal, that mistake. Yeah. And it proved to me that the system works, right? Mm -hmm. Like the system that we've created for things to be streamlined, it actually works. So that made me feel good. Yeah. Yeah. And then and, and again, I hope that's helpful for other entrepreneurs because I think it is helpful for me just to realize that that's a step that needs to happen. We we think we're too much in our business, especially us side hustlers, right? And us solopreneurs. And when we're building the business from the ground up ourselves, we can't ever get to that level that we want to get to where we can disconnect when we, we need to and we have to and think more creatively or think higher level if we're in the nitty gritty every day because we're scared yeah. to relinquish control. Yeah. What other ways do you think you've been uh, working on personal development? Because the Jerry I see, I just feel like you're always sharing books. You, you can tell that you're really tapping into a, a more enlightened space. Is that because that is you thinking about the next level of t- of Jerry like where are you going next so going into turn and natural um, I say this often I never thought it was going to be as successful as it has turned out to be really? um, the goal yeah, no like I just I really just wanted to sell juice like <laughs> that's all I wanted to do I did not want to have multiple locations I did not want um I didn't want to turn it into this enterprise. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of, it organically did it, right? Um, because again, logic, my background is engineering, so logic is up there for me. I just knew that I needed to cut cost. So, you know, mm-hmm. farming was important, relationships with farmers. I just, I did not see it. I did not foresee this. So when people say, oh, what you did was genius, I stopped them. It really wasn't. Um, I just took an I took an untapped market mm-hmm. and, and put it in a place that it need, you know needed it. Right. So when people say oh, you're like you're selling, you're doing these numbers in in these communities, I'm like yeah, because who said underserved meant impoverished? Who said mm. underserved means they didn't have money? They just don't have underserved is lack of access. Yeah. And so changing that mindset of you know people who live in certain places don't have uh, access to money. They have access to money. They just don't have access to the things that that you think that money could buy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I did not foresee it becoming what it became or it's continuously becoming. But I knew once we started to grow that I did not want to do this forever. Mm-hmm. I'm the type of person who believes in quitting <laughs> and quitting often, right? Because quitting doesn't mean you you lost or quitting doesn't mean defeat. It's like, okay, I'm ready to go to the next thing. And so it was after that third location, I was like, how do I create my exit? Mm -hmm. Because stress was at an all time high. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just bad stress. It was, you know, we were opening at seven o'clock, which meant someone had to be there at six o'clock. We have in the last nine years of business, we have probably been broken into at least six or seven times. Um, there's just a lot of things that you don't see that are you know that are happening you have vendors who are Mm -hmm. going out of business or discontinuing a product you're trying to grow into a co-packer to produce some things and they're like oh you're too small and then when you get big enough they change the dynamic again so there's so much that was happening and have to rely on communicating with 15, 20 people. And then as you continuously grow, you get more staff. It was just a lot, a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And I knew then I had to create my exit plan. Mm. And so I did not, and still do not want to juice for the rest of my life. And when I tell people that I'm ready to move on to the next thing, they're like, well, why? Like, it's it's so, (laughs) well, that's when you move on, right? That's when you go, you don't just leave when it's like dead. Yeah, Yeah. right. 
So, yeah, that's when I decided that, hey, it's time to think about next steps. And for me, it was spending time with me. Mm. Like I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning, literally feet hitting the ground. I'm checking the, the motion detectors. I'm making sure everybody's in the place that they're supposed to be in. I'm confirming that Cisco is still in route for delivery. Is at 8 a.m. Like I was just doing so much that I didn't have time to breathe. And then you start looking in the mirror and you're like, huh, I don't look like myself. Mm. And then you don't feel like yourself. And then you really start to think like, who am I now? Like what I do has become who I am. And that's not, that's not me. And so in this space, time is a true luxury. Like having time, I get up at 6 a.m. I don't put my feet on the ground to seven. I don't answer anything related to business until 9 a.m. I'm done by 3 p.m. Like after 3 p.m., you call me, text me, email me, anything <laughs> related. Because I had to create those boundaries. I was going from 4 a.m. to 10 o'clock. And we get so caught up in that. I'm grinding. I'm out here putting it down. Grind Like, girl, but who cares about any of this if you're not here? Yeah. Can this even go if you're not here? Right. So, you know, making time to do yoga. I really enjoy yoga. Ah, I love it. I had tennis today. Um, I've been skating. Yeah. I've been doing really random things because I just don't want to wait to live a life that I'm not promised. I am so happy to hear you say that because that's, some, I think, one of the things that um, concerns me sometimes when I speak to different women on this show. And also I think about for myself, right? Like what what does the next phase of Nikayla look like? And, and so I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs um, also consider that because... The thing about starting a business versus um, having a job is like, like you said, like people graduate from jobs. You know, you spend X amount of years at a company and then you're like, I'm ready for something new, ready for a challenge, or I'm just tired of these people. (laughs) So you get your resume together, you interview and you move on. Now, what happens when you start a business and you're ready to move on, right? Like um, it's a phased process. So it sounds like first you, you know, you trained and you empowered people and you started to to so, slowly shift your responsibilities um, to trusted leaders within your team. And then mm-hmm. also start to think about what you want in your life. So you started incorporating things like tennis and self-care practices. You know, what do I want my days to look like? I think it's so important for us to hear this, to hear that it's possible. Yeah. So what is what does it look like for you when you completely graduate from being in the business of turning natural day in and day out? Do you know? Um, yet? So, well, yeah, because I'm not in the business <laughs> Okay, not, we, we, we're already there, yeah. I'm not in anymore. I had to make that hard decision mm-hmm. um, because, like, and I'm going to be completely transparent. Right before, 2019 was a what looked like a very successful year. Business did well, mm-hmm. right? We opened, yeah, we opened Eastern Market. No, we okay. opened Eastern Market in 2020. We opened Shaw in 2019 mm-hmm. and you know from the outside looking in jerry is doing phenomenal turning natural is doing phenomenal but there were nights that i would wake up in full-blown panic attacks to the point that i had to go to the emergency room like something's not right Whoa. why am i waking up with this amount of anxiety or waking up in the middle of the night checking the cameras and i was like this isn't healthy this isn't healthy and I don't want people to feel like you just have to always be in this grind hustle mode. Yeah. Um, and self-care is more so giving yourself the time and discipline to really take care of yourself. So it's not just getting my nails done. It's not just getting my feet done and facials. It's like really doing the work of getting to know who I am outside of what I do. Mm-hmm. And and that I made, I 2019, I made that decision. I'm coming out of this because this is not healthy for me. Mm-hmm. Um, 2020 came and I'm like, you know, you get little breaks with snow days because I get to close the store. But when March hit and they were like, Maryland, Governor Hogan was like, I don't care what y'all talking about. Close everything. <laughs> I'm like, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. 
close it off. Well, were you stressed um, about that though? I mean, that's yeah. I was at my wit's end. I was uh-huh. over it. Yeah, I was over it. And honestly, I was like, and if we never reopen, oh, <laughs> you <no>. know. <laughs> so, yeah. but so we had to close our our Maryland location, our DC locations, and my biggest concern was my team. Right. Because of majority of, of them are hourly. If they don't work, they don't get paid. Yeah. And so I transferred my Maryland group to I dispersed them throughout D.C. I changed the store hours. We were doing like two staff per shift um, just so that they can keep uh, social distancing. And I got some of the best rest of my life in the last in that in 2020. Well, you know, of course, it wasn't that I wasn't stressed about what does this look like going forward? Yeah. But I was like, let me take the time that was given to me to relax. Mm. And I sat on the couch. I watched verses. I watched all <laughs> the of these movies. I went down rabbit holes. <laughs> like, it was just, I needed that. Yeah. I needed those months of just really, really relaxing. And it, it caused me to think creatively yeah. Right. So I got more ideas about how to transition out, how to, you know, elevate my team to give them more ownership. That's when we developed the profit sharing so that store managers are not just store managers. They have some ownership in what they do every day. So if it wasn't for that time of a break, I wouldn't have been able to come up with that. So, yeah, I, I wasn't. I was like, if it if we never sell another juice. <laughs> But what does that look like? I mean, fiscally, like, were you, are you set? Like, you're just, you know, like, I don't ever have to work again <laughs> or. I, let me say this. I Because going in, like I said, around store three, I knew that I could not do this forever. So I said, what is the number that I can live for the next 50 plus years? Right. Let's say 50. Let's say yeah. God gives me 50 more years that I can live 50 years comfortably, like maintain all of my bills. I can still go buy a bag or something if I want it. <laughs> I can have two lessons, I can do yoga. What does that look like? Yeah. And so um, again, being financially set is a, financial freedom is a, a, it looks different these days. In the beginning it was like, what can I, what things can I acquire? Now mm-hmm. it's like, how do I live comfortably and yeah. conveniently right like i don't like to do certain things i don't like to clean my house i'm a mm-hmm. neat freak but i don't like to clean my house <laughs> so i need to add that into my financial freedom yeah. i don't want to go to a car wash can somebody come to me yeah add that into my financial freedom but yeah and so i'm not in it no more it's, yeah. i'm working on it and you know for years people have been asking about franchising i feel like that's still more work <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not. I was opposed to it. I'm not anymore. Um, an acquisition would be very nice. Mm-hmm. What is walking away and walking away wealthy mean to you? Again, walking away and I can live a comfortable life, meaning a, a life of luxury and convenience yeah um and so and and we don't talk about that enough i think that people think that once you create a business you you just supposed to be there forever Um, and, and I think that, also, like when you think of brick and mortar businesses, I think sometimes they get a bad rap of just draining a lot and not earning the kind of profit margins that would be able to set you up for a life of luxury, right? You see, you, you I guess you think more of the restaurant model where like as sexy and glamorous as it looks like, oh, I own a restaurant, actually, it can be really hard to make money, right? So yeah, the profit margins are very skin in the yeah. restaurant and from the beverage. Yeah. So so I, I guess that's the part where I, I want to help people see if they have this type of business, what can they do, you know, to to ensure that they can have the path that you're taking. So one of the first things that I realized when we started to make money was that I had to put the money back into the business because it's easy to you see that money. Right. And first People need to pay their taxes because they're collecting sales and use tax and they ain't paying Uncle Sam and he gonna come back for his money. 
Um, so yeah, putting the money back into the business. Yes. And putting it back into the business in a way that makes sense. In the beginning, I didn't care about marketing. I wanted to perfect my product. I wanted you to have the best smoothie, the best juice, so that any other place that you went to, you had to compare it to Turn It Natural, right? Like, oh, well, Turn It Natural, they don't use ice. You're right, we don't use ice. <laughs> we don't use quality fruit. We're going to freeze it and blend it up for you. We don't add water to our juices. So mm -hmm. making sure that I had the best product that I could possibly have. And then I started to focus more on, like, branding things. So I noticed mm -hmm. a lot of people were taking pictures of their juice in their hand. And I just hated that. You didn't know it was turning natural yeah. or we were writing with Sharpie markers, like what it was. And I was like, oh, I hate seeing this. Um, so then it was like, OK, now I have to invest in bottles. So making sure that I reinvested into my mm -hmm. company and that we talk a lot about having a personal savings account. Yeah. Your business needs to have one, too. Yeah. Your business needs to have one, too. And I'm so glad that people that I. I Friends, mentors who are also in business yeah. talked about saving, yeah. like really saving money so that I didn't feel that struggle of can we pay our rent this month? You know, mm -hmm. I pay over $38,000 in rent throughout D.C. Mm. So when the pandemic hit and your your sales are Is that down, monthly? Is that? <laughs> Total monthly. Wow. Yeah, DC ain't cheap. Uh -uh. So when people come and complain about a seven dollar juice, sis, sis. <laughs> we have bills, and not one of those landlords care, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So having a good savings so that you know I can maintain yeah. all of those monthly bills because I mean you got some relief, but it wasn't forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It was relief. Yeah. Um, saying, hey, we can we can figure out three months and then after three months and then because they were piecemealing it. No one knew how long this would last. We didn't know we were going to go to almost a year, basically yeah. shut down. So, yeah, but I had a savings for the business for each location wow. to say, hey, this money is designated to this because things happen. Blenders break. The air condition goes out break-ins you have to replace the glass same day mm -hmm. um so making sure that you have money set aside so that your business can operate the same way that you operate personally i love that having a business savings that we, we you're right we don't talk about that enough we talk about personal savings of course investing back into the business but i think having a business savings is clutch all right um and then finally i know you wanted to touch on like the human side of entrepreneurship the human side of entrepreneurship like the behind the hashtags <laughs> behind the i don't even know what right like what yeah. is the human side of entrepreneurship that um we don't talk about enough you know we're still people Right, like we're still very much people. And I don't, I take at this point, this will be year nine. The yeah. criticism doesn't bother me as much. Um, in the beginning, I took it extremely personal. <laughs> um, no, like I get emails directly addressing me. Um, so I don't get the emails, but I see the emails. Yeah. Direct, they believe that they're talking to me. Um, and like telling me what I need to do because they had an experience, right? Mm -hmm. that, that that wasn't pleasurable at whatever location. And I do take on the responsibility that the people that they meet in my stores are first impressions of me, yeah. right? They, they think of it as me. And sometimes I read those things and I'm like, you couldn't possibly think that there's a human on the other side of this. The things that people say or if I walk into a store and I go straight up into my office, I've had people email me like she didn't even speak to the customers. And it's like, you have no clue what my day looks like on a day to day. You have no clue if I'm running late to a meeting. Like there's, you forget that there is a human side of all of this that you see. Mm -hmm. And I also think that people think that success takes away from just day to day troubles. 
Mm-hmm. Like I still have things that happen. Money doesn't solve every problem. I can count how many people actually say, hey, how are you? Mm. Right? Like, just how yeah. are you? How are you doing? Yeah. Instead of like, you know, well, what store is this? How, you know, what's, what's business life like? And I'm like, girl, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I want to exist. Um, yeah. Yeah. When, when I meet people and people ask, you know, what do you do? I say I work in a juice bar. Mm-hmm. Because anything else turns the con- the conversation shifts, mm. and I just want to be able to exist in a space that what I do doesn't matter. Yeah, like it just it. I'm su- I'm still super regular. I still do yeah. regular stuff. Um, but yeah, we we forget that there's there's a human side. Like we are still human beings. We're still yeah. going to make mistakes, um, and we don't know everything. Sometimes we're first generation business owners, so we're figuring things out. Yeah. And you got to allow us the grace to figure it out. You got to allow the people that work with us the grace to figure it out because they are also first generation working for a first generation black company. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. A lot of it, it was a lot of pressure from that as well. It's like, I don't want to talk to these people. I am a true introvert. I just have social skills. So people don't feel like I'm an introvert, but I will will disappear in a second. (laughs) You know, I feel you on that one. Like, I am like, if I say, like, I'm not, yeah. Uh, I can't even verbalize just how much mm-hmm. I relate to that. I will disappear in a heartbeat. Like, y'all will and see. And he's like, where did, where did Jenny go? I feel like, that way. Even though, like, weirdly enough, I like miss conferences now, right? Because COVID took away those opportunities to, you know, see and talk to other women, especially black women. I I miss that. But usually when I'm at a conference, like I am, you know, at a targeted few sessions and then I will be in my hotel room. Y'all not going to see me. I'm not coming to the social. (laughs) I I applaud people who can I'll come to a little bit and then I'm back in the room, you know, decompressing. Yeah. How do you cultivate um, the awesome business relationships that you have with uh, fellow black women entrepreneurs, though? That's something that I admire and respect about you a great deal. I think that it's so important that you could really tell that iron sharpens iron and, and, you know, that you're able to support and learn from each other. Wow. Um, Those relationships just... I don't want to say just those relationships happen organically, right? Like either we've crossed paths or we knew we had a a mutual friend or a mutual associate and we just kicked it off. Um, I I'm surrounded by some like out of this world, black women outside of entrepreneurship, like just some really, really amazing black women. And It's cliche, but black women really are magic. Mm -hmm. We really are magic. The way that we show up for each other, the way that makes us feel seen. Um, One of my friends, Angel, who owns the Spice Suite, like when she showed, like she sent me a picture of a patty, and I know she goes to Turn It Natural often, and she knows I. She tells me at this point, I don't need no more spices, and I'm like, (laughs) as long as you're making it, I want it. So, um, but to see that, like to know that they are showing up for me, if something's happening in a store, she'll text me and say, "Hey, I was in a store. This is what I saw," and it's not like, "Girl, get your team." It's like, "Hey." I, I see you. I know what this I know what it feels like and not too many people will do that. Yeah. So it's just it's amazing to have that tribe of people who will mm. put you on and say uh, one of the main reasons I went and got a coat packer is because of Arsha. Mm. Like Arsha is I love Arsha so much. Yeah. Arsha, Arsha Jones of Mambo City, uh Capital, Capital City. City Mambo, yes. Um just phenomenal people. So yeah. those relationships again came from just either our paths crossing some way, and it wasn't to because I haven't done business with any of them. Yeah, right. But we, I need an accountant. Hey, I need to switch lawyers. I need a financial advisor. You can literally pick up the phone um, and and call them, and somebody's going to make it happen for you. Yes. Love it. Um, And, you know, before we jump into the lightning round, I just want to say on that note, 
Um, I'm just so proud and happy for you. I have followed your journey. And of course, you were in the guest chair in 2017. And so, you know, to see the evolution and and I'm really looking forward to what's coming next. You know, I, I really can't even imagine it like I know that life is going to lead you somewhere that you might not even know right now and it's going right. to be it's going to be amazing and dynamic to see and it's also going to be like of course of course she's doing that because like <laughs> she's amazing and she's learned so Thank much you. so Thank I'm you. just I so glad to be I, I appreciate yeah. it and I, I I feel like I'm a reflection of the people that I'm surrounded by thank you for even inviting me to be in the chair oh, right because that's yeah. You don't think that your story is that important until somebody says, oh, yeah, you got yeah. some things to talk about. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate you highlighting so of many course. phenomenal black women and stories that we would probably have not seen if you yeah. had not created this platform. Because I can't like I still can't get over it and I, I, I just can't, you know, overstate. Like, I think it's just so incredible to walk past Attorney Natural Juice Bar and to know a black woman owns this at multiple physical locations are owned by a black woman like that is incredible and you know it's not it's not something we could take lightly so i i just have to highlight you i just I can't pick you up enough <laughs> i remember i did my live show and i was like oh there's turn natural over here i gotta get a juice i, I put it on instagram like <laughs> i i got to and it's so tasty so i was like a no-brainer <laughs> but yes it's so weird to me to see it, even after all yeah. this time, it's still like to see people with a turn a natural cup and to the point where I know our straws. Yeah. So I'm like, that's like, oh my God, that is so <laughs> cool to me. That is awesome. I know that has to be a little bit like, ah. <laughs> So, all right, now we're going to do a quick lightning round. It's funny, I was just listening back to your first lightning round. So I know you're not going to remember the answers, but I'm, I can't wait to see what you say. Oh, God. <laughs> so, number one, what is a resource that is helping you these days in your business that you can share with other side hustlers, entrepreneurs, especially those who might have a brick and mortar right now in the time of COVID um, that is helping you out? Oh, you know what? Okay, so this is new. <laughs> um, the company is called Margin Edge. Okay. And what they do is like every vendor receipt, every invoice, my production team scans it in. So it tells me, because produce changes, right? Like ginger could be twenty dollars today for a 40 pound case it could be as high as 90 some odd dollars tomorrow because it's literally like the stock market for produce mm -hmm. so what i wanted to know is i wanted to skim down on the numbers even more like i wanted to get as close to perfect as possible so what it allows you to do especially if you're working in volumes you don't have mm -hmm. to have a food and beverage you honestly don't have to have a brick and mortar if you want to properly scale you need to know your numbers mm -hmm. so Knowing how much it costs to produce a 12 ounce smoothie, a 16 ounce smoothie, a 20 ounce smoothie, a 32 ounce smoothie, and little to no loss, um, on top of letting my production team know how to order, it scales everything. And it lets me know if I'm paying too much for something, if I've consistently bought it over time. So Margin mm. Edge is phenomenal. They'll walk you through the process. Like I said, you do not have to have um, food or beverage. It could be any product. Yeah, that is a awesome resource that I have not heard of. So thank you for that, because um, I think knowing how to financially model and really understanding what it costs you to do something is a skill and not even a skill. It's, it's, it's something we all need It's a resource. We all need to make sure yep. that we are as profitable as we can be. Number two, uh, I, I love listening back to your answer on this last time. I know you guys know this is a fake lightning round. It's not, not lightning about it. But anywho, who inspires you <laughs> these days and why? Oh, so <laughs> I'm going to keep my answer the same because she continues to inspire me. Um, my leak, love her. Yes. Like, even... Uh, like, I just can't say enough. She, what I love the most is that she continuously challenges you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, challenges you to think bigger, to go bigger, do bigger. Um, 
be bigger and she has this unique way of making people feel seen Mm -hmm. and not just as a group but like individually like I see you I'm going to give you every piece of information that I have because I genuinely want you to win Um, so it it remains my league (laughs) number three what is a personal habit that has helped you in your business and in your life so I think on the first one I said reading which still still helps me to this day. But the newest one would be yoga. Mm. Um, it has forced me to be present in a, a way different way, right? Like being present isn't just about like, oh, everything that I need to do is like, like if my team is talking to me, I am engaged. My phone is away. I'm not focusing on anything else. It's just you and I talking. So being present and breathing, like you just don't realize how much you don't yes. breathe in, breathe yes. out. So reading and yoga. Okay. Number four, what is a non-negotiable part of your day? Schedule. Mm-hmm. My schedule is non-negotiable. If it's not on my schedule, it's not happening. Specifically business, right? Mm-hmm. Like I can, I'm fluid when it comes to you know, what time I'm going to eat and all that other stuff. But if it's not on my schedule, it's not happening. My team knows when people are like, oh, can I talk to you for a second? Mm -mm, (laughs) Because I have to be prepared, right? Like you can literally drop a bomb on me and I I don't have the time to recover from it, to go to my next thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Even now with like interviews, um, I... You're still my favorite interview. Oh, like, thank you. Yes. No, seriously. I'm not just saying that because I'm right here. Yeah. I appreciate <laughs> no, that a lot. That means a lot. The questions are intentional. Um, it's not a redundancy of it. So I, even in that, I'm like, what are you asking? Yeah. Um, because at this point, there's so there's information out there. Yeah. And I don't want to just keep giving that information over and over again because we talk a lot about what we do. Yeah. But we don't give enough of how, like, yeah. how do we get this stuff done? Um, and sometimes the hour just isn't enough, but mm-hmm. I like to be an open resource to people. Yeah. I'll answer questions. I don't have like, oh, you got to pay me a fee. I'm not a business consultant. I'm yeah. going to tell you my experience and you do with it with what you can. So final Final, final thing we're going to ask of you is to share with us some parting advice for fellow Black women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but may be scared of just stepping out and doing it. Uh, I feel like at this point, if you're going to be scared, you probably shouldn't, Mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, there's always going to be some sort of fear factor in it. There's always going to be something that you might not know. Yeah. I'm an advocate of doing it. Just yep. do it. Yeah. Right. There was a lot of mistakes that I made in the beginning, but I would not have grown to where I am now if I didn't hit those brick walls. So if if you're going to allow the fear to paralyze you, then just stay right there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're really real really talk right willing, here. Yeah. If you're really willing to go that extra mile, yeah. despite the criticism, despite people I mean, really, I was going into the hood of the hood to sell green juice. Yeah. And people were like, what? <laughs> right. So I could have allowed, I could have allowed that to um, to stop me. And it was an interview that MC Hammer did. And I've been trying to find, I saw it one time because Sway talked about it. Sway, um, the, Sway in the morning. Yeah, the radio yeah. host. Um MC Hammer, he asked MC Hammer, what was the most expensive thing you ever bought? And he said, other people's opinions and problems. Ooh. And it it stuck to me. Like, it really, really stuck to me. I need to find that. If you're going to allow people to to paralyze you with their criticism. Yeah. And and what you think people are going to say, like, I didn't know anybody was going to come to buy a juice. Yeah. I didn't know that people were going to come to multiple locations to buy a juice. It's like really step out there. And what makes it a little bit easier is when you have a plan, but don't get so caught up in the plan. (laughs) And I see a lot of people getting caught up in like, Oh, how do I make my business visible? Mm -hmm. Have an amazing product, have an amazing service. That's how it's visible. Yeah. 
people talk about it. That's yeah. how it becomes visible. Like you don't need to meet the right person. Your customer is the right person. Mm-hmm. And that that is the note we needed to end this on that. I mean, that spoke to my heart. I think that especially coming back from maternity leave, it is something that um, I struggle with. You know, I'll be transparent about that is just these fake narratives we make up in our head of what other people are going to say, what they're doing, what you're not doing. If you're not keeping up with and all this other stuff that you just need to shut up and and. Mm -hmm and just keep it moving. So um, that's why I'm here with you today doing this video interview and I didn't used to do video interviews. So I, I, know. You, I thank you so much for being here. Where can people connect with you and Turn It Natural after this interview? Sure, if you want all things Turn It Natural, Facebook, Instagram, our website, www.turnitnatural.com. On Instagram, it's at Turning Natural. Um, if you want to follow me, I go down rabbit holes. I like to sing. <laughs> Um, and I'll give a book recommendation here and there. Um, I'm Jerry Chanel, J E R R I Chanel, on I guess all platforms. All right, and there you have it, you guys. So we will link to all of that in the show notes. Um, and if you want to hear more from Jerry, make sure that you head over to those platforms. And with that, I will talk to you next week. Thank you, Nikayla. Bye.